Second lecture of Bio 202, I stick with that bigger context we talked about in the first lecture. I also try to set up the young Charles Darwin as an individual not too different from where a lot of college biology students are in their own intellectual developments, fervently interested in nature and living things, yet not committed to any single field of study. Darwin's theory of evolution by natural selection is a big deal. It's the context for everything you'll ever study as a biologist, and it's an idea that took shape within its own particular historical context. The narrative I'll share with you here is more than just an accounting of facts. There are points for you to think about along the way. Especially important are those that get at the question of what is science? So most people will automatically associate the words Darwin and evolution. Nothing wrong with that. But did you know that Charles Darwin was not the first to suggest that living organisms change their form over long periods of time? Sure, in Darwin's day, this would have been the 1800s. Cool bit of trivia here is that he was born on the same day of the same year as Abraham Lincoln, February something. 1809. So given this time frame, the prevailing understanding for the existence of all living things, at least in the part of the world where Darwin lived, was biblical scripture. And the account of creation given in the book of Genesis would not really allow for evolutionary change, right? That's a big part of the objections that creationists have with science. And this is the group that continues to this day to demonize Darwin as anti-biblical or something like that. But historical fact. There were plenty of thinkers that came before Darwin with the same suggestion that organisms changed and changed dramatically over the Earth's history. One of the earliest evolutionary thinkers was the Islamic scholar Ibn Khaldun, whose 14th century book, Yes, that would be the year 1377. The Muqaddimah was clearly foreshadowing Darwinian thought nearly 500 years before the publication of The Origin of Species. I'll let you read through the passage on your own. It's unlikely that Darwin was familiar with the Mukadima, but my point is that plenty of people had the idea of great changes in living forms over time, or, as we now know it, evolution. It's not an idea that started with Darwin. Another evolutionary thinker that you won't read about in your textbook, still before Darwin, but much closer to his orbit, would be Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, author of great literary works like Faust, which is the drama involving a guy who sells his soul to the devil. Perhaps you're familiar with the story. But Goethe also engaged in scientific study. He did some amazingly insightful work on plants. We will be dipping into some of this later this semester. And also on human anatomy. He basically demonstrated that all mammals, humans included, had an intermaxillary bone in the front part of the upper jaw. His approach tended to follow a theme we now refer to as homology. When two organisms share a common ancestor, there will be similarities between them that were inherited unchanged from that common ancestor. The concept of common ancestry was central to Goethe's biological insight, and he even noted that organisms had, quote, a felicitous mobility and plasticity that allows them to grow and adapt themselves to many different conditions in many different places, unquote. And to me, that sounds a whole lot like evolution. And it was published in 1831. Given Goethe's renown, this was almost certainly read by Darwin. Lamarck. Now, you won't be seeing either Khaldun or Goethe mentioned in the textbook readings for this lecture. The well-known name that comes up most frequently as a pre-Darwinian evolutionary thinker is that of Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, 
Lamarck proposed an evolutionary theory in which organisms changed during their lives and then were somehow able to pass these acquired changes on to their offspring. The well-known example is that of Lamarck's giraffes. As I'm sure you know, giraffes have very long necks today, but fossils indicate that in times past, giraffes had shorter necks. Lamarck knew this and suggested that modern long-necked giraffes are the descendants of shorter-necked giraffes, and the change occurred because, over the course of many generations, the giraffes had to extend their necks in order to reach their food, leaves in the trees, and consequently ended up with slightly longer, more muscular necks. This characteristic of bulked-up necks somehow got passed on to their offspring, who also had to extend their necks, making them even longer. Over the course of many such generations, the short-necked giraffes became, you might say, evolved into long-necked giraffes. Or so Lamarck's story goes. At this point, everybody in class has a good laugh at the utter ridiculousness of this idea. Of course, we all know that what you pass on to your offspring has little to do with anything that happens to you during your life. Your kids won't be born with the tattoos and piercings that you had done before reproducing. You can't do any exercises at the gym to make your future kids more athletic. What you pass on to them are the same genes that you received from your parents, unchanged, barring extremely rare and random mutations, as well as some very minor epigenetic changes that will dissipate in at most a couple of generations. A couple of things about the giraffe story of Lamarck. First, it unfairly misrepresents Lamarck's thinking. Sure, he did say this about giraffes, okay, but to emphasize only the mistakes gives the impression that Lamarck was a lot sillier than he really was. The scope of Lamarck's evolutionary theory was broader than just this idea of inheritance of acquired characteristics. It was well argued, and it was taken very seriously by many. And although we may laugh today, Lamarckianism held up as the preferred mechanism for evolutionary change in many circles, well into the 1900s. It's unfair that a person gets remembered for one particular blunder rather than their many positive contributions. In the case of Lamarck, he's the one that coined the term biology. Come on, that's pretty impressive. Second, Lamarck published his ideas on evolutionary change 56 years before Darwin did, and yet no one nowadays thinks of Lamarck as the father of evolutionary biology, and creationists don't lampoon him, or for that matter, Khaldun or Goethe, as the monkey's uncle. Why is that? Why should Darwin take all the credit and the heat? Think about that a bit. Okay. So let's actually put ourselves in Darwin's shoes during his college years, first studying medicine in Scotland as a 17-year-old. Things were different then. But then dropping out and changing majors to divinity. Yes, divinity. At Christ's College in Cambridge, where he was studying to become an Anglican parson, basically a preacher, as this was his plan B. It was near the end of his studies in religion. That's when the opportunity came up for Darwin to join Captain Fitzroy and the crew of the Beagle on a two-year expedition to Tierra del Fuego, that's the southern tip of South America, and the East Indies. Basically, his role was to be the ship's naturalist, collecting and documenting the things they encountered along the voyage. For a nature not like Darwin, this was a dream come true. He got to travel, he got to do all the things he loved to do, and Darwin's experiences on the Beagle played a big role in his development of the theory of evolution by natural selection. Things just gelled for him perfectly. The perfect combination of influences and evidence flowing into his consciousness.
Let's start with the influences. Well, Lamarck was definitely there. While Darwin was a medical student, his mentor had been a student of Lamarck, and Darwin's study in medical anatomy would largely have been Lamarck's teachings. As a divinity student, Darwin's main inspiration was the Christian apologist William Paley, who was considered the father of natural theology. Now, apologetics is the area of theological study in which one uses reasoned arguments to support religious doctrine. In the case of natural theology, Paley used the intricate complexity of living organisms to prove the existence of a powerful creator. Paley's most famous writing is one where he argues that he can infer the existence of a watchmaker by the evidence presented by a regular pocket watch. You don't actually need to witness the fabrication of the watch by the craftsperson. It would be ludicrous to say that the watch could exist without there being a watchmaker, and so the watchmaker exists whether you see them or not. Paley said that just looking at the complexity of something like the human eye, that's enough to demonstrate the existence of a maker for it and all of nature as well. Now, this inferred watchmaker argument is pretty powerful as an explanation for the existence of the intricate machines that we are, as are all of the living organisms inhabiting the Earth. Darwin himself found it beyond compelling. He absolutely worshipped the writings of Paley. But as explanations go, it is also supernatural. It relies on a creative force that's beyond what we can understand as occurring within the natural laws of the universe. As such, there is little that can be done to validate this explanation with experimentation or other observations from the natural world. In other words, it's not science. If creation by God is your explanation for how life came to be, then biology for you is really an arm of theology. In the natural sciences, we restrict our scope to explanations that are consistent with the laws of the natural universe, subject to both support and to falsification by observations from the natural world. The other thing to note about Paley's watchmaker argument is that before Darwin, there really was no alternative mechanism capable of explaining the intricate complexity of living organisms and their seemingly perfect fit with the role that they play in their natural habitat. Female mosquitoes have syringe-like mouths which are perfectly suited to puncture human skin to access the blood. What force, besides an all-powerful creator, could account for such ideal mouth anatomy in mosquitoes? Well, evolution by natural selection, of course. We know this now, largely thanks to Darwin. Darwin's model filled this enormous gap, giving the world a completely naturalistic explanation for how complex organisms could come about even in the absence of a supernatural creator. The irony here is that Darwin absolutely worshipped Paley as a student at Christ's College, he could practically quote the entirety of Paley's book, Natural Theology, from memory. And then he gives us Evolution by Natural Selection, which relegates Paley to the dusty old shelves of books on ancient ways of thinking. Here's a good point to pause for a little reflection. What distinguishes science from non-science? Think about the contrast between creation with a capital C and evolution by natural selection as two competing explanations for how a mosquito's mouth came to be this sharp little syringe-like thing. And what about Lamarck? Why wasn't his evolutionary explanation an adequate alternative to natural theology as, for example, an explanation for the perfection of the mosquito's mouth? Lyell. Besides Paley, 
Two other important influences on the young Charles Darwin were the geologist Charles Lyell and the essayist and economist Thomas Malthus. The story with Lyell requires that I bring into the narrative yet another French dude, Georges Cuvier, who at the time was the biggest name in science, though by most accounts, he was a horrible person. Cuvier was much bigger than Lamarck, who was a pretty big fish himself. But even Lamarck, who had the misfortune of being French, and therefore readily accessible by Cuvier, took regular squishings under the authoritarian thumb of Cuvier. Despite his significant shortcomings in the area of being a decent human being, Georges Cuvier gave us many important foundations for evolutionary biology. He was the one to establish beyond a doubt the phenomenon of extinction, which if you think about it, seems like a pretty heretical concept. If God created a mastodon, which in addition to being the name of a death metal band, is also the name of an ancient elephant-like thing. If God created this thing and then caused it to disappear completely from the face of the earth, does this mean that the mastodon was some kind of mistake? What could be more heretical than suggesting that God makes mistakes? Cuvier also gave us the rule of superposition in stacked rock strata. Higher layers are younger than the layers of rock underneath. And so the extinct forms of life you see on top are younger than those below. And he also noted that the younger extinct life forms are more similar to modern forms than the older ones. And if you put two and two together here, you might be thinking that Cuvier was basically reading the fossils as an evolutionary record. And yet, you'd be wrong. He vehemently defended young Earth creationism throughout his life. In Cuvier's thinking, the Bible's book of Genesis records only the history from immediately before the last great flood, that of Noah, to the present. Before Genesis, there was creation version 1, creation version 2, creation version 3, and the Noachian flood of Genesis would have been the destructive blast in version 4. That's right. Three earlier acts of creation and destruction preceded the events documented in the Bible. Cuvier's weird rewriting of history has a name, catastrophism, and he proposed this as the explanation accounting for two things, mastodons, as well as other extinct life seen in fossils, and also the great geologic features of the Earth's surface, mountains and canyons, which would have taken shape over four independent acts of creation and four floods. It's this last bit that stands as counterpoint for Charles Lyell, who, with James Hutton, had offered a different explanation for mountains and canyons. They basically said that mountains are formed through a very gradual process of uplift, in which the ground level rises by a few centimeters each year. Imperceptibly slowly, but over enough time, this could lift an area by kilometers. As the land rises to form the mountains, it's also slowly worn down by another gradual process, erosion. These gradual processes operate very slowly, but continually, and over the course of eons, their effects add up, giving us great mountains, valleys, and canyons. This was really Hutton's theory, called uniformitarianism, that was formalized and published by Charles Lyell in 1830 the year before Darwin hopped on the Beagle. So here we have a situation with a supernatural explanation for the existence of mountains and canyons, that of catastrophism as proposed by Cuvier, challenged by a completely naturalistic alternative explanation, uniformitarianism as proposed by Hutton and championed by Charles Lyell, which, unlike the supernatural explanation, could be investigated through careful observations in nature. It's really not a fair fight. The scientific explanation can be supported by observations from the natural world, and for both erosion 
and uplift observations were made and they did in fact support uniformitarianism. Supernatural explanations cannot be supported by observations from nature. That's kind of the definition of supernatural. So as evidence piles up higher and higher in favor of uniformitarianism, catastrophism gets no additional support in its favor and is effectively left behind, smoked by science. Darwin was party to this accumulation of evidence favoring uniformitarianism. In The Voyage of the Beagle, published much earlier than The Origin, and this is actually my personal favorite of Darwin's life works. In The Voyage of the Beagle, Darwin documented things that he witnessed that resulted in him being completely won over by Lyell's thesis. There's an important side story here. In order for the geologists to be correct, the Earth would have to be much older than the few thousand years allowable with a literal interpretation of biblical scripture. Without vastly greater amounts of time, there would be no way that gradual geologic processes could account for mountains and canyons, and also no way for gradual evolutionary processes to account for the diversity of life on Earth. By validating uniformitarianism as the mechanism of geologic change, this also required that the Earth be of great age, millions of years, tens or hundreds of millions of years. Now we know that the Earth is almost 4.6 billion years old. The modern tools we use today to make such precise estimates were not available back then. But the one thing that was clear was that a young Earth of only a few thousand years was no longer a viable idea. If you think about it, Lyell opened two doors for Darwin's intellectual progress. Unlike Lamarck, who 50 years earlier had to struggle with the age of the Earth issue, Darwin had the advantage of there being an already accepted chronology with vast amounts of time that would allow for evolutionary change to occur. You could also say that he took inspiration from the idea of gradual change. Incremental changes in a population from generation to generation, we will call this microevolutionary change, add up over hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of generations to result in substantial change, change that would be recognized as species level or even genus level or greater, differences between the starting and ending points. Thomas Malthus. I think of Thomas Malthus as the El Gore of his day. Gore, if you don't know, used to be vice president of these United States. And after his term in office, he took on the cause of global warming and educating people about the existential risks posed by a changing climate and the great likelihood that humans were themselves the cause of the warming. Gore capitalized on his fame publishing a book, An Inconvenient Truth, which gained wide readership in the early 2000s. Malthus's equivalent of An Inconvenient Truth was his Essay on the Principle of Population, published in 1798. He showed that if you look at the size of the human population inhabiting the British Isles over time, the number of people was increasing exponentially the bigger the population, the faster its rate of increase, giving rise to this characteristic J-shaped curve of exponential growth. Meanwhile, the production of food on those same British Isles was increasing as well, only linearly. It would not keep pace with the growth of the human population, and time would eventually come in which there would not be enough food for the people, there would be famine, and a poor quality of life would be had by all. Both Malthus and Gore were bearers of very bad news. As Darwin's theory was taking shape, he realized at some point that in order for the population to change from generation to generation, it would not do if every individual in the population were successful in surviving and reproducing. If everyone succeeds, then the population remains the same from generation to generation. In order for there to be change 
And in order for that change to result in adaptation, there must be considerable mortality. A lot of individuals must die without reproducing, and those who survive and reproduce would need to have heritable characteristics that make them better fit for their natural conditions. Here's where Malthus comes in. What Malthus showed for the human population on the British Isles must also be true for every biological population. Every living organism has the capacity to increase in number exponentially, and this is totally not sustainable. At some point, there will have to be a lot of mortality in a struggle for existence, and this high mortality is exactly what Darwin needed in order for his model of evolution by natural selection to be plausible. Malthus's essay, written years before Darwin was born, gave him a mathematical proof of a whole lot of death that must occur in natural populations, thus making natural selection possible. This is a good spot to break between the two parts of this lecture. 